Good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm Dr. Leon Seard, and I'm excited to be here for this important discussion. I'm, we're also so excited to have with us a uh, mother-daughter psychologist, Dr. Cynthia and Allison Powell Hicks. They are certified mental health relationship experts, as well as television personalities. You may have seen them hosting like Mother Like Daughter on Discovery Channel and OWN. Thanks for being with us, doctors. Thank you, doctor, for having us. Yes. Yeah, thank you for bringing us on here. You have my boy Earl over there. I haven't yeah. seen him in a while. I was like, I wish I could have talked to him too. <laughs> well, we'll have to make that happen one way or the other, you know. <laughs> um, ladies, in, in, in our current climate, especially in the light of the COVID pandemic and the social tension and political polarization, mental health has become an issue as this was this whole webcast is about. Mm -hmm. Anxiety disorders are the most common mental disorder in the, in the United States. But data showed that black women, for black women, anxiety and depression are more chronic and the symptoms more intense than their white counterparts. Mm -hmm. Can you enlighten us a bit on um, one, describing how and why depression symptoms and diagnosis are uniquely different in black women? Well, first, there are compound issues that are being faced by, by marginalized communities, which the African-American community is obviously one. So having to deal with typical stressors that a lot of people deal with that can impact and compound um, and create depression is one thing. And then we're also dealing with systemic racism. We're dealing with lack of access to medical treatment. We're dealing with um, other stressors in the life of having lack, a lack of access to other types of resources. And so we are seeing this compounding impact and then not to even mention or forget to mention ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. So mm -hmm. African-Americans might be more likely to experience ACEs, which are things that happen in our um, early life. Um, things like uh, poverty, things like um, abuse, witnessing violence, um, noise pollution, lack of access to education, and these types of things can build up and impact the way that we experience ourselves with mental health as well as um, can impact physical problems in the future. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Dr. Alley, because past trauma, I think, really plays a, a major component in this and the way that we were raised as African-American women in a racial and racist environment, you can't unring that bell. So it's how do you process it once you are realizing that you are developing some of the depression or, or the SAD uh, pathology or symptomatology. And we as strong black women have been told that we can conquer and handle anything. And we really don't have to go outside of our community to seek support. So then it's not a surprise why we appear to, to present a, a sicker once we come in for, for medical and mental health treatment. Dr. Cynthia, you kind of must have been reading my mind because I was about to kind of go there. Dr. Alley, you mentioned racism. Uh, and Dr. Cynthia, you mentioned the strong black women. You know, we know that that black women are faced with racism in this country. And we know about the stereotypes and the memes and the tropes, Mammy and Sapphire and Jezebel, the angry black women, the strong black woman. Um, could you expand on these challenges that affect black women's health? Absolutely. I think the biggest trope, like the one that my mom brought up, is this strong black woman, this magical black woman narrative, this idea that no matter what you put on top of us, we're going to handle it, we're going to deal with it, we're going to muster our way through. And I think there's a difference between doing something because it is adaptive and doing something because it is forced upon you. It is just what you have to do. So it doesn't necessarily make us better, stronger, more capable of dealing with things because you can. There is a point where stress can be helpful, right? We talk about like use stress. So you experience a stressor, you learn to adapt to it, and it builds up a level of resilience. But you can experience enough stress to where it actually creates, like I mentioned before, long-term health problems, which is why we see in the Black community hypertension, diabetes, heart disease. These are all stress-mediated disorders. And so these types of narratives don't just serve to make us more stressed and depressed in the um, short term, but in the long term, as well as impacting our health and the way that we interact with others. And then we have them being repeated through media. So like you mentioned, like the Jezebel, mm -hmm. we see the Jezebel commonly in media spaces. Um, Pam, 
from Martin was a, a good example of a Jezebel, kind of the woman that's like, nah, -uh, boo boo, honey child, nah, -uh, you ain't gonna do that to me, not today. Uh, -uh. And it kind of gives this impression that we are always able to kind of like manage, right? Somebody comes to us and says something we don't like, we're able to defend ourselves, take care of ourselves, but it doesn't give for the breadth and the diversity of how African American women express themselves emotionally. We're not all going to be able to do that all the time. Sometimes we're going to say, that hurt my feelings. I'm feeling vulnerable. I want to be sad. But then once you're seeing this trope over and over again, and then you encounter a woman who's doing that, you might think like, why is she so different? What's going on? Why isn't she in control of things? Isn't she supposed to be strong? And so now that woman's feeling vulnerable and isolated because people aren't responding to her in a way that could actually be helpful. Yeah. And that leads me to saying, do you know why there's so many strong Black women? Did anyone ever think maybe because we have to be super women because we're not having our, our needs met? So women, this is your time to have dialogues with people in your village, in your community, in your sisterhood, in your, in your family, with your relationships. Make sure that you take care of you, because if you can't take care of you, it's going to be very difficult to to uh, combat the different types of uh, mental illnesses and, and uh, physiological type illnesses that do come just generational. I mean, I won't even talk about, you know, um, going from latency age to adolescence, then to young adult and then to adulthood. And we won't even start talking about menopause. Help us now. Anyway, but, but strength. and you need as much strength as you put out, you need to be able to receive as well. That's uh, as a follow up. I mean, that's really good to talk about those things in terms of, you know, stages. I mean, women have the seasons of life, the stages of life you started to allude to, Dr. Cynthia. Can you um, guys kind of expand a little bit about some critical intervention points for Black women? Is it, you know, the transition from young adulthood to adulthood to the workforce to uh, motherhood to being in a relationship? Um, and especially with respect to the stressors. Um, and the stigmas and even the suicide risk there? I think every moment, every single opportunity you get. Um, I think starting off in childhood, right? Because that's where we develop our coping mechanisms and we develop kind of the pattern, the character that, that we're going to take into adulthood with us. You know, people say you kind of become who you are within your first five to seven years of life. You learn how to maneuver. And so I think that's a really important interventional point, right? Helping our little baby girls understand you can ask for help. You can cry, you can come to me, you can come to other people, it's okay. And then, um, because when you find yourself in a space, um, like we're African American women have found ourselves where we can't reach out, one of the symptoms of depression that is actually seen more in African American women than other people is somatization. So these physiological symptoms, we feel our depression more than other people, which can impact us at other phases of life. So when we are you know, starting menstruation, that could be impactful in the way that we start to experience this point in our lives. And then obviously um, African-American women also experience more postpartum. And so at that phase where now you have a woman entering her adult years and starting her family, um, because some of the risk factors for postpartum are a history of trauma as well as a history of depression. And so if you haven't been engaged in regular treatment or therapy or kind of know the flow of how therapy works, it might be hard for you to reach out at a point when maybe something's going on like that. And then obviously during um, your years as you're getting older, there's this idea of generativity versus self-doubt um, or generativity versus stagnation. This idea of like, what do I do with my life now? I've lived most of my life. Where do I go? What do I, what kind of, what do I give back at this point? And these are all really important phases where we need to be checking in with ourselves. Um, but really we need to be checking in with ourselves all the time. All the time, yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, that 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 put it that that opened up another uh, thought that I was having because as you transition from from motherhood, from losing a spouse, from empty nest syndrome, even though I might say this generation, I've heard a lot of stories where the nest is empty for a minute, but then it comes back. So how do you still have your needs met? How are you still taking care of your adult children now without stepping over the, the lines too to, to much? So the main, the main situation that I would really encourage is communicate, communicate, communicate. Monitor yourself, monitor how you are experiencing life throughout these different phases of life. And don't be afraid to ask for help. You are human. You need the help. 
because nothing is worse than when I've seen people that they have refused or felt uncomfortable receiving the help when it's something that's minor or preventable. And then it's full blown after they've already tried all the different um, anecdotes that their neighbors have told them or their family members or church members have told them. And then they end up in the emergency room with major disorders like major depression. And at that time, it, it is totally full blown. And then you have to take, um, you know, measures of possibly hospitalization. So, so if you can do prevention, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, just kind of pick it up, almost like, can you continue to read my mind, Dr. Cynthia? So, I mean, <laughs> okay, don't you, say you that because every... <laughs> <laughs> to, to avoid, to avoid the, the getting to the emergency room. So what we talked about racism, we talked about seasons of life. Uh, we talked about the unique uniqueness of the black female. What are uh, methods of, of treatment or management, uh, either try to prevent you getting to an acute blown out phase, uh, you know, that can be done, whether it's traditional treatment or complementary treatment or even some innovative interventions that you might know? Yeah, well, you know, as a coach, I'm all about the innovative treatments. <laughs> um, I am uh, truly, truly a renegade. Um, but I think that there's uh, multiple ways in which treatment can happen. You have definitely the importance of licensed clinical practitioners, therapists, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, master's level therapists, getting the psychological work done as well as the biological work. So I've been talking a lot about the intersection of mental and physical health because we are a connected holistic system. One impacts the other. So going and getting your regular checkups every, every year, going and getting your dental work done, getting blood work, looking at your hormone levels to make sure that everything is functioning in a way that is efficient and effective. So that's another part of your team. Mm -hmm. And then even if you have somebody on your team that um, is maybe a coach or someone who can help you to reach some of the goals that you have immediately in your life. But I, I really think for us as people of color, it is also important to look for decolonized clinicians. Mm -hmm. So looking for clinicians that understand blackness, the experience of the diaspora and how these um, interventions might work for us as opposed, as opposed to working for European Americans or white Americans, because it's different. Right. We've established we have different stressors and we also have different ways of coping. Like they mentioned in the last segment, church is, and religion is a part of our reality. Okay. And we want to be able to talk about our spiritual expressions. And it doesn't just have to be Christianity. There's a number of different religions that black folks participate in. And we need to be able to connect with a clinician in as many parts of our lives as possible. And so um, and you might not be able to find a decolonized clinician, obviously, um, initially, but you know, they say therapy is like, finding a good, good therapist is like dating. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's, go, go ahead, Dexter, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Okay, I was gonna say, I wanna bring in uh, two others here who can probably give us a little bit of uh, some uh, 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 real life uh, contribution to this discussion here. I wanna bring in uh, Ms. Carla J. Wright, who is a grant specialist and Christian writer and singer from Indianapolis, Indiana, and then Chaplain Gail Masando, who, greets us from the motherland. She joins us from Johannesburg, South Africa, where she is a life and recovery coach and founder of the Sozo Safe Place for Women. Welcome, uh, ladies. And uh, I, I want to, I don't, uh, if, if uh, Carl has gotten in here, um, um, I don't see her, but we'll just kind of yeah. keep going. And Gail, um, you know, we, as we talked about here, we know that the uh, in the black community, the black community and the di uh, diaspora are not monolithic. And uh, these mental health issues affect uh, everywhere. They're not limited to black women in America. Can you share us about what, you know, what your experience is and what in your work there in South Africa? Well, one of the things I can share this evening is that we're in load shedding, which means we don't have electricity for two or three or four hours of the day. And it just happens that at this time of the night, we're experiencing um, uh, no power. So as it relates to the mental health issues that affect black women, you know, women of color all over the globe, we face similar, um, um, similar uh, traumas and stressors. I was so happy to hear um, the mention of uh, mental health and biological health and um, that they 
work in concert with one another. Um, and in my practice as a counseling therapist, one of the things that we're faced with, you know, we're not 30 years old in democracy yet. So we're still dealing very closely with the issues that were left or we're still um, dealing with issues of apartheid and how it affects the family unit. And so we find that we're dealing with, which is not unique to South Africa or the continent or America, but we're dealing with female heads of households mm -hmm. and single women. And we're dealing with um, children heads of households as young as 10 and nine because of what the HIV AIDS pandemic did to our community. So we're having young girls having to really take a stand before having a childhood. Um, they're becoming the sole breadwinners. They're becoming the disciplinarians. Um, and so they're losing their childhood. They're not having it. We're also, unfortunately, we are, gosh, I don't know, we have the highest rate of gender-based violence and rape in the world. Mm. Now, I don't know if, if it's just that we're taking statistics here in mm. Southern Africa, it's kind of hard to, to have that kind of effect, um, to know that we have the highest rate of hijacking. We have the highest rate of rape, violent rape. There is no, well, rape is violent, but um, many, of our, um, many of our women are less dead or mutilated. So there we're saying that, that has, that's an after effect as well of mental illness after apartheid. It is, um, and we're able to pack that and say that what's happening is this leftover anger, rage that's going on. We're also dealing here with, um, I'm so glad that, our, our, uh, that Dr. Hicks and Dr. Alley talked about the idea of this strong, this word strong that is thrown around, you gotta be this strong woman no matter what. And mm -hmm. and I don't even know that we understand what that means to, when we hear a woman who's lost her husband or lost her son and she's sitting in front of the casket, she's sitting and walk, looking at that casket and we walk away and say, oh, that woman was so strong. How about she's numb? How about she can't believe what has happened to her psychologically? And she's trying to gather her thoughts. Mm -hmm. And I think that we do ourselves disjustice. I really do. When we say strong, then that means we're not given permission to trust. Mm -hmm. We're not given them Yes. That, what that gets me thinking of is proximity to whiteness. It's this yes. idea that the closer you are to the stiff upper lip British white perspective, the, the more like in control you are, the more like yes. strong and stoic. When we see over and over again, like in spaces of like toxic masculinity, that, uh, that not giving, uh, not being allowed to have emotional expression helps. Right. Right. <laughs> and then when you do that, it, it kind of uproots the stability of, of the community and your family because they think you are that one. Mm -hmm. You are the go-to, you are that strong person. That is, I mean, Ooh. Also uh, dealing with heart failure um, between the ages of 25 and 48, we're finding mm -hmm. that, um, you know, we were stuck in the HIV AIDS pandemic, you know, and our focus was there. But now we're finding out our, our women between the ages, women of color, between the ages of 25 and 48, we're, we're dying of that broken heart syndrome, which has nothing to do with romance, everything to do with stress. And so there's also the new South Africa phenomena where um, we've experienced it at home. I'm a New Yorker by birth, but we've experienced it at home where there was a period of time, Dr. Hicks, you may remember where, and, and Dr. Um, Sear, where there was the black female, black male conferences that were happening all the time. How come we're not getting mm -hmm. to get along? What do we need to do in our, in our communication? And we're faced with that now where it is our young black females are in management um, and, and doing very well, very successful, making the money where our black males are being kind of left out. So mm -hmm. I work, 
uh, my counseling is directed at professional women. We hide better behind our jobs, behind our title, behind our address, mm -hmm. but we're just as broken and just as wounded and, and, and needing a place to speak. Um, and, and we need that balance because while we're being raised up, our men are being pushed down. And, yes. and then it can cause a lot of um, disharmony and, and conflicts, you know, just within your support system, which is supposed to be your family. Oh man, yeah, this is and, this is just so this is just so rich, so rich. I mean, I, I wish since since you've kind of alluded to it, Gail, and um, just kind of as a last last thing here, if I, I read a um, a a prayer that Ianla Van Zant wrote in response to the Tyree Nichols situation, mm -hmm. and it seems like it's an analogous to what the women in in South Africa. Experience. I'm just wondering if you guys would really quick and rapid. What advice would you give? What counsel you give to mothers who are suffering under this trauma repetitively um, every day in South Africa and too often here in 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 America? When you know me, I believe in communication. Don't hide anything. It might be you know, but make it age appropriate because they're going to experience it it's out there you can't hide it you can't deny it but it's how you like safety plans like you have for your home during earthquakes or tornadoes or whatever you need to have a real hard talk with with your young with your young people well even with all of us i mean any police brutality you know is is real and and no and my heart goes out to mothers uh, of sons because they're targets Mm. We used to, yeah. and Jack and Jill talk about sleeping while while black, driving while black, breathing while black. You know, it's re it's real. It's real. So we need to communicate better regarding it, not to be afraid of it, embrace it, and and move forward. And you know, just be self assured and know that you and your family can do the best that you can do with what you're given. This this is a hard one for me because there's so much variation when it comes to families and family structure, right? We mentioned black community is not a monolith. We have people in South Africa with very specific needs and culture, people in New York with specific needs and culture, LA, New, you know, Boston, wherever. Um, but, you know, if I had, if I got to be like the president of blackness, um, to me, it's collaboration and finding a way to find community because that's one of the differences we see in countries that have higher levels of depression as opposed to countries that have lower levels of depression is that when a when communities are able whatever those communities look like right when they're able to unite and and support one another in really real um vulnerable connected ways we do tend to see improved mental health spaces mm -hmm. do i know how that would happen no, no. i do not i do not <laughs> yeah. um yeah uh, the one yes, thing that yes. i just want to just add back in my day we went to the church that was the backbone of our community. That was our community. And that's where we went for all of our questions, all of our support and our pastors fought for our community. One, one of the words that I've adopted since living in South Africa is indaba. And it's a beautiful word because it means gathering and it's a coming together of minds. No one takes the credit for the solution. Everyone comes together and gives their, their thought, their opinion, how can can this work? We did a program a few years ago when there were baby rapes here in South Africa called um, Isililo, and it was called Mother's Cry. And it took us a whole year to just go from communities. Um, we spoke to mothers and daughters. We spoke to fathers and mentors and their sons. We spoke to professional, um, professional, you know, mental health workers and we came away it took us a whole year we were not rushing we were having conversations and out of that year we ended up and and it's 15 years now we have a family abuse prevention center in soweto mm -hmm. and, and and that took some time but it was focused and so that has to happen um more and more often you know that these quilting mm -hmm. beads that our mothers and grandmothers used to have in the south of America. Those yeah. quilting beads were, yeah. were therapeutic right then mm -hmm. because we got together to speak and to talk mm -hmm. and to share. And we can never do enough of that, that kind oh, of community. Yeah. 
all ages, all stations of life, and being able to share and share honestly. This is, um, yeah, thank you so much. We, um, I wish we had more time because I mean, this is this could go on and on and on. Um, but I want to thank all of you for kind of helping us to see and be reminded of the importance and the issue of mental health to Black females uh, throughout the diaspora. Um, of, and uh, and really thank you for letting us to see, you know, that it's, you need to be cognizant of what's going with yourself every day, that there is hope out there and, uh, and that, you know, you can, um, uh, there, there are ways to navigate and that you're not alone in this struggle. Thank you so much. I have to tell you, Gail, I'm, I'm this top I got, I got when I was in South Africa as well. So, um, and, and thank you so much for the, for this platform. Yeah. Oh, yes. yes, thank yes. You. And, Absolutely. you know, it, it was like all of you kind of touched on the idea of the spirituality and we alluded to it earlier. And we, as um, uh, Dr. Ali said, you know, the, the church has been historically the place where we find refuge from stressors and um, that compromise our mental health. But there's a, a recent uh, Pew Research Center project that found that the black church was the most stigma and closed space for mental health illness. So there is some disconnect yes. there. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to have our pastors to talk about that uh, on the other side of this uh, well, introductory video. I'm all for decolonizing the church, too. I think we have to do our work. We have not been doing work to decolonize the church. We've got too much That's whiteness true. in there. Please don't get me started. I will go on don't. forever. Please don't. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on forever. board, too. <laughs> Thank you once again. Thank you. Good night.